here today to gathered together for a special, very important moment, the opportunity to give thanks, to express our love, to express our humble gratitude for all that she did for all of us, our beloved Betty Barron. She excelled in being a mother and a grandmother, a wife, a sister, and a good friend, a good neighbor, a good person, a person with a very big heart, a person who loved her family and loved her friends and loved all the people in her life. So today we're going to share some of her stories. I have the opportunity to hear some beautiful th share some beautiful things that I learned from the family, that I saw with my own eyes at times, and also most importantly, to hear from her own family herself about her beautiful ways. And we take it for granted at a Jewish funeral that we tell stories, we talk about the deceased. But I always like to remind myself that we do it because it helps us, it gives us consolation, it gives us strength, but also we do it because we believe that Betty really hears us, that she really knows. You can imagine the joy that she has, that she lived this whole life, that she did so much, and people will always notice, people always remember all the good that she did. That all the fighting and all the struggle and all the years she had in this world are really worth it because of all the beautiful things that she did and left behind. So we say the psalm, Psalm 23. People are welcome to follow along in the Hebrew or in the English. Mizmer le David, Adenai roi lo exar, binais desha yar bitzeni, almei menuchos yenachaleni, nashi yishovei v'yancheni v'maglei tzedek leman shemo, gam ki elech v'geit salmaves, lo irara ki ata mimadi. Shiftecha o mishantecha, hema yenachamuni. Tarach lefanai shulchan, neged soirai, dishante vashemen roshi, kosi revaya, achto vachesed yer defuni, kol yemei chayai, vishavti bebeis adenoi, la orech yamim. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in right paths for his namesake. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou hast set before me a table in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's also our custom at the passing of a woman, a righteous woman, to recite what is called the woman of valor, Eishas Chayil. I'll say some of it in Hebrew and followed by the English translation. Eishas Chayil mi yimsa v'rachok mipnini mechra v'atach v'alev bala v'shela lo yaksar g'mal su tov v'lora kol yemei chayecha d'arsha tzemru fishtim v'taz v'hapetz kapecha haisa kaniyo socher Mi merchak tavi lachma, betakam be oid laila, pititin teraf, lavesa, hoik narasecha, zamama sade vitekahehu, mi pri kapecha, nata karim. An accomplished woman who can find far beyond pearls is her value. Her, husband heart, her, her husband's heart relies on her, and he shall lack no fortune. She repays his good, but never his harm, all the days of her life. She seeks out wool and linen, and her hands work willingly. She is like a merchant ships from afar, she brings sustenance. She rises as well as yet nighttime and gives food to her household. She envisions a field and buys it. From the fruit of her handiwork, she plants a vineyard. With strength, she girds her loins and invigorates her arms. She discerns that her enterprise is good, so her lamp is not snuffed out by the night. Her hand she stretches to the distaff and her palms support the spindle. She spreads out her palm to the poor and extends her hand to the destitute. She fears not snow, for her household, her entire household, is clothed with scarlet wool. She makes a cloak to sell and delivers a belt to the peddler. Strength and majesty are her raiment. She joyfully awaits the last day. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and a lesson of kindness is on her tongue. She anticipates the ways of her household and participates not of the bread of laziness. Her children arise and praise her, her husband, he lauds her, 
Many have amassed achievement, but you have surpassed them all. False is grace, and vain is beauty, a God-fearing woman she should be praised. Give her the fruits of her hands, and let her be praised in the gates by her very own deeds. In my work at Montefiore, I had a chance to see Martin and to see Betty, to see a couple who were together at a hard time in their life. I saw each of them their special strength, and in particular the strength that Betty had, the strength to go through her illness. I saw her family and the love and dedication that they had for her. But so often when you see people who are, there, who are sick, you don't know the whole story. How did they get to be so strong? How did they have the resilience that they showed at the end of their lives? So I was very pleased that I had the opportunity to speak to the, the daughters, to Carol and Marjorie, to learn a little bit more about Betty, to learn how she could do it. She was brought up in a small family, just her parents and her older brother, Bernie. And Bernie came 11 years before her. So when she came to this world, she truly was a treasure, a princess, and was fussed on very appropriately. She attended Cleveland Heights High School and was a good student. And she worked at various places, including a paint company and other local businesses. But her life got an amazing start. Things really started to happen when she would meet her future husband, Martin. And it happened through actually a blind date sometime after school. They were not people at all who were similar. They had different personalities and different ways of dealing with life. But they were so amazing for each other. There were two people who truly complemented each other and truly depended upon one another to get through the day. Their relationship shows the power of letting go and accepting and the power of giving. The fact that they had such a good relationship that they reached by each other's side for more than 60 years. She was always happy to support him and to make sure that he made it through his pharmacy school. She wanted to make sure that he had a good start. And when it came time for the store, running the pharmacy, she made sure that everything that she could do from her home to make him worry less and be able to work and do his job as he's supposed to, she did that as much as possible. She had an accounting background and she was a very organized person. So she would do the books, pay the bills, again, basically take care of everything so Martin didn't have to worry about anything but the daily needs of the pharmacy. But still, with all this work that she was taking home from the pharmacy, she was able to be the total stay-at-home mother. She was very good to her own kids and raised them in a most beautiful way. And she also had space for her own mother. Her mother, Frida, came to live with them from the early days. And she always made sure that her mother was taken care of respectfully and appropriately. She didn't leave her post as a stay-at-home mother until well into the kids' teenage years when they're already onto their own lives more and more. She did so much for her family. Her most common roles were as the chauffeur. She was always busy in the car, going back and forth to activities, ice skating, different events, always willing to take the kids somewhere if it made it possible for them to do more in school, to do more extracurriculars, to succeed more. And it wasn't just for her own kids that she was the chauffeur. She was a chauffeur for the whole neighborhood. Everyone knew that they could count on her for a ride to wherever they had to go. And it wasn't just at her own kids that she was so good at raising. She couldn't wait to have grandkids. And she excelled at the role of being a grandmother. But her role as a grandmother wasn't just, you know, patting them on the head and saying how cute they are and wonderful they are. She really, really wanted to be a mother for them too. She wanted to raise them and help them and guide them. They had, she had, their kids, the grandkids had beautiful, had beautiful parents, but she felt uniquely as a grandmother with her insights and her life experience and her personality, she could offer them even extra and even more. She made it possible for Carol to go to school, to go to engineering school, and she said, don't worry, I'll take care of the kids. I'll make sure that they're okay, so you have nothing to worry about except for school itself. Whenever the school would call and there was a sick kid or someone needed to come pick something up for a kid, she was the one that they called. She was the one that was always available. She felt so much pride and love for her grandkids. She didn't hesitate to call them anything less than her jewels, because as far as she was concerned, they were perfect. They were perfect sparkling gems with no flaws whatsoever. She was caring and loving, and she took interest in all the details of their lives. From what I understood from the girls, from the daughters, 
was that when you would have her on the telephone or she would inquire about the kids, you couldn't get off with a simple answer like, oh, so-and-so is doing great in school. Everything is fine. Everything is okay. No, she wanted to know a lot more. She wanted to know all the details because she wanted to make sure that everything was okay. And the thing about her was that she had an insight. She had a thought. She would give it. She would share it. She was never too proud or never too, you know, stay backish to not say her mind. And many times it made a huge difference, her opinions and her assertiveness and her help in making sure the children had just the perfect upbringing. She made it very clear to the kids and the grandkids that you guys, your family, was the most important thing that you have. And for years and years, they would always gather together at Carol's place. So whether Carol lived in Hudson or in Canton, close by or far away, she made sure that everyone got together as much as they could on those Sundays. She never forgot anyone's birthdays, and she was always ready with a card and a phone call on just the right dates. But this, this peopleness, this love for people and social, social, socialization wasn't just with her family. She didn't just favor her family. Fortunately, she shared it with everybody. And she was a true people person. She was always finding new ways to find new people and spend time with other people. She always promoted her kids doing the same, joining activities, getting out in the world, meeting people. She and her husband always went to couples events. And she, of course, was the avid talker. She was a big talker. Wherever she went, she wanted to share what she was thinking and what she was doing. And of course, she had a thought or an opinion on lots of things. And that made the conversation a little bit more interesting. And one of the glues that she had with people was the fact that she was a sports fan. She loved sports tremendously. And she was a typical Cleveland sports fan. She loved them when they were winning, but pretty mad at them when they were not. The TV was on when they were winning, but it was off when they were not. The key to Betty's success, you know, her happiness and her fulfillment in life, was just simply the fact that she just kept busy, that she never slowed down for one moment. And that's why it's so funny, because you, you read this prayer, this Eishet Chayel prayer, very often in the Jewish funeral service, and it really talks about the woman as being the absolute balabusta, you know, she was busy from you know, morning to night. She was selling stuff. She was fixing stuff. She was growing stuff. You know? So not everyone can fit those criteria as a modern woman. But you know, she, she really did herself so beautifully, constantly busy. And when she wasn't caring for the kids or the grandkids, she was reading books. She was staying up to date on current events. She was talking to friends. She was giving advice to other people. And she was spending time with the people who she loved the most. And of course, this was her family. But she also had the blessing of beautiful friends. She had her sister-in-law, Estelle, who came with us today, which is a great honor to have Estelle. And she also had her best friend you know, from her early, early years, Tia, who came here as well. So it means a great deal that these two ladies, her best friends, could be here for her at this special time. Of course, she loved her Maj and Canasta groups. She was very good at these card games. She was a very sharp lady. And these card games were perfect because she could apply her sharpness and win as much as possible. And she could also apply her sociability and she could be with the people she loved to talk with so much. One thing that kept her busy was her husband's hobbies. And I, th I remember I was honored also to speak a little bit about Martin. And his ho hobbies were pretty amazing, <laughs> were pretty extensive. And a lot of women would say, ah, just get fed up with his hobbies and throw stuff out and say enough is enough. But that wasn't her. Even when he built the boat in the basement that didn't fit, and wouldn't come out the basement he had to, until he had to um, take it apart and rebuild it. You know, those kind of things didn't get on her nerves. In fact, not only did she put up with dad's hobbies, but she was the one who actually, I believe, facilitated it. She was the one who went shopping for the glue or the wires or whatever when he couldn't make it. And that was how much she believed in his hobbies. And she would proudly say that he worked so hard. He had such a hard time at his job. He does so much for people in the pharmacy. He's entitled to all this good fun, and I'm happy to be a part of it. She wasn't a big cook. Her recipes didn't get posted in any amazing places. And she wasn't enjoying much of seamstress, you know, being work. But she was pretty busy with all the other things that she did so, so well. But still with all this busyness, she made sure that there was time for vacations. And the family enjoyed their vacations during the summer. And she was happy to go wherever else everyone else wanted to go, especially where dad wanted to go. That would be her choice also. And the summer trips were pretty amazing, and they went to some pretty good places. And I couldn't help but hearing, I thought I misheard it first, but I did hear Marge say that they once went mountain climbing, that that was an example of a family vacation that she took. So I guess that makes her pretty brave as well. 
There were certainly many good times raising her children, and many good times after the kids were out of the house and the grandkids came along. But there were also unfortunately hard times. It was very hard when dad got his dementia, when dad started to become ill. But the thing about Betty was that she took these challenges in stride so beautifully. Even when it was obviously make, made, would make one upset or it was very frustrating, you know, what dad could and what dad couldn't do, she never lost the ability to laugh. At, would make, would, at things that often would make people cry and upset and angry, she somehow had the ability to laugh at these things and not to take them too seriously. She always said that no one should be so sad and upset and angry by life that there was no way to laugh at life too, whenever you could. And even some of the things that Martin said that didn't make a lot of sense, she would instead laugh at instead of being upset and to cry. And she even had a lighthearted approach to her own self, her own, her own mortality and her own, you know, ten, you know, her own future, who knows how it would go. And she would say sometimes when she wasn't doing so well, maybe when she was being a little bit forgetful, I don't know, but she would say that if, if I ever get too goofy, just throw me into Mount of Fear too. And that, you know, so obviously, you know, she had no problem calling, you know, some people say dementia or forgetfulness or if I get sick, but she called it like it was. If I get a little goofy, it's my time to go as well. But it's funny, there was one thing that she wasn't so flexible about, and that was, of course, the television. So, you know, I'm glad that Ed is here because Ed is part of this discussion, that, you know, she could only be comfortable in her later years as long as the television was operational. And if not, it was a major crisis. And when she, she would sometimes call and say it was not working, and that did not mean that Ed could take his time and, you know, and come slowly. He had to come immediately because it was a crisis and it had to be resolved. And as much as she loved Martin and she wanted to do everything for him, when her shows were on TV and his shows were on TV at the same time, that was his cue to go upstairs and watch his shows on the upstairs television, which was a little smaller. So this brings me to Ed, you know, a, a close friend of the family. And he got close to Betty, you know, and is taking care of Martin. And I, I heard from the family and I could see myself that Betty felt such a sense of awe and appreciation at what he could do for her husband. You know, really, really got into her that what you did for Martin. And she noticed that and it made such a difference to her. And the fact that you took such good care of her husband, we believe made her accept you so, so easily and take to you so well. And ultimately, when she wasn't able to do things like feeding herself and doing certain things in the hospital that they wanted her to do, you were the one who were able to do that because of that trust and appreciation that she had for you. And so you are a big support and a, and a very important part of this family. So in closing, it was a very hard year for this family. You know, we saw you guys, you know, less than a year ago at the passing of your father. But, you know, to try to find light in this, these difficult circumstances, I can only help but think about, you know, what was shared with me about how Betty was in her last few months in her illness. That even though she was very sick, and even though she had many struggles and so many hospitalizations, she could still get excited about things. You could show her a picture. You could give her a piece of news. You could even show her a picture of Olivia, the new little chihuahua who came into your life, and her face would shine very brightly. And that was the amazing thing about her. I think she will always teach us that lesson that life is never too sad, that you can't laugh, that there's always a bright light and there's always a good opportunity in the middle of a sorrow. So we just hope that her light and her strength and her guidance stays with us. And I know that you can't help but live with a person like she was, who was so firm and so strong and so positive and not to feel that blessing. And so she should bless us all with that strength and that guidance and that give us that strength to go through these challenges that we face. So it's my honor to call upon people who really knew her so well and who benefited so beautifully from the dedication and devotion that she gave. So at this point, I call upon Alan and Patricia, her grandchildren. everyone thank you for coming um, Trisha and I just wanted to say a few things about grandma um, when I was thinking about things that we could say um, one thing that uh, came to me was um, well when I was very young uh, mom and I moved in with grandpa and grandma and so I spent a lot of my childhood with her and um, 
and this is true of all her grandkids though she was extremely proud of us and I, I thought back to how when I was a kid if I was uh, getting into trouble kind of like the worst thing that uh, mom or dad could say would be I'm going to tell grandma what's, what you're doing and I'd be like oh my god don't tell grandma and I th was thinking why why was I so afraid of that and it was because she was just so proud of me and Trisha and Brian and Julie uh, her grandkids that um, you just would never want to disappoint her and she wouldn't be mad at you <laughs> like that that the, the worry was never that she was going to be mad at you it was that she would disappointed and you would let her down and you never wanted to do that because she because um, she was so proud of you and um, that uh, that extended to her great grandkids as well um, she has three great she had three great grandkids um, two are mine um, our daughter Zoe and uh, our son Malcolm who's three and uh, when Malcolm was born um, grandma called me and she's like I, I live in I live kind of far I live in the Washington D.C. area and um, she called me and she was like I'm coming to his bris <laughs> and that was that was a big deal for her she was she was not doing well physically it was, it was uh, hard for her to move around um, but um, she was so proud um, that she made sure that she was physically there for it and she was we have pictures and great memories um, so. Um, you know, she she was a big uh, formative influence on me. I'm really gonna miss her. Um, and, um, so her and Grandpa are together now. So it was it was uh, it was something to be happy for. Yeah, just to add that she always was so proud of us. grandma just meant so much to the whole family. She really was the rock for my mom. Mom would call her every day after she got off of work. <laughs> and I just would always hear from my mom how much she meant to her. And, it, and that was very important that I knew my mom had somebody to always talk to whenever she needed to go. And that I will always have my mom to talk to when I need somebody. My grandma was just always so proud of anything that I did, no matter how much I acted out or anything. <laughs> I could always, you know, depend on her to really tell me firm how it should be, how it, how I, you know, really should <laughs> should be acting <laughs> instead of acting in my teenage ways. Um, and I could depend on her to have the barren look. Um, and I know. <laughs> I know those close to us know what that look is like should you really be doing that <laughs> and that really I just always know that look um, whenever I needed it I would get it um, and I just I'm so happy that she is in a better place now because she was very sick but I, am, I just will miss her very very much thank you mention really briefly we have we have the two other kids I know Brian is in the audience and I know Julie is listening to us through the webcam and she very much wanted to be here but I think she heeded the, the advice of her mother and perhaps her grandmother you know and doing first things first 
And so I think it sounds like the Barron family approach would be the, the best thing to do is where you're supposed to be, being successful in graduating, not coming here because you feel you have to be here. So I know Julie came up a lot, and she's very much, her presence and herself is very much with us, even though not physically, but she's doing what her grandma would have wanted. So just brief announcements. You know, we're going to be going to, you know, after today's chapel service to the interment, which will be taking place at the Ridge Road Cemetery. Um, that's on Ridge Road, the first cemetery, just after the 480, not the Chesed Shel Emma Cemetery, which is the second cemetery, uh, also along Ridge Road, just a little bit away. And then following the interment, um, for those people who can join the family and us, um, there will be a reception at the Fairfield Inn. Um, that's a hotel in Beechwood. It's 3750 Orange Place. And we will be back probably at around 1230 or so at that time. And then that will be until 6.30 p.m. that we will be receiving guests um, at the Fairfield Inn. And if people are inclined to give a gift, they don't have to, but they're welcome to give a contribution to the Giaga Humane Society. And we didn't discuss it so much, but Betty loved animals tremendously. So if you can't give some cash, maybe just give an extra hug to your animal, which is something that she would do. So if everyone could please rise now for the final memorial prayer. Malay Rahamim, Shaykhain Bam Romim, Hamsei Menucha Lechaina, Al Kanfe Hashkina, Bimalois Kedoshim, Utahirim, Kazerakia Mazirim, Es Nishmas, Basia, the Halach Loilamo, Bavor Shanachtu, Miss Pali Madhaskars Nishmaso, Began Aden Tehe Menucha so. Lachain bal harachamim, Yasti rechu, Besaser can afavli oilamim, Vayit sorbet sarachayim, this nishma so, Adenai hu nachala so, Vayanuach amishkava beshalom, Benomar, amen. O God full of mercy, who dwells on high, grant proper rest on the wings of the divine presence, in the lofty levels of the, the holy and the pure ones who shine like the glow of the firmament, for the soul of our most beloved Betty Baron who has gone into her world and for whom people pray. May her resting place be in the Garden of Eden, and may the Master of Mercy shelter her in the shelter of his wings for all eternity. May he bind her soul in the bonds of life. God is her heritage, and may she repose in peace on her resting place. And we say together, Amen. So, Zichrona Lebracha, we pray that her memory should be a blessing, and her light and her goodness should shine upon all of us as we go through our days. At this moment, if folks would just go ahead and grab their coats, and we're going to have the pallbearers come forward. We're going to escort the casket first out the door, and then the family and then the friends will follow behind as we go through in the procession. <laughs> 